Admiral, we believe sailors and Marines join the Navy and the Marine Corps for the right reasons. Those reasons might be different to every single service member, sailor and Marine, but for that person, those reasons are the right reasons. We would submit to you, though, that Marines and sailors are leaving the service for the wrong reasons. We're going to talk to you today here about the Grass is Greener campaign, an operation that we believe the Naval Service, the Navy, the Marine Corps should be executing time now. Admiral, the question that you posed to our group for talent management was what actions can the armed services take to better attract, recruit, and retain talented leaders of tomorrow? Well, you will hear from the findings of our group are consistent with all your publications, your recent publications, your guidance, and your directives to the force. We must meet this next generation of leaders, young and talented leaders. We have to meet them where they are at. The proposals that you will hear from these group of briefers are aimed to increase that real Appreciate and perceived value that the service member has of their own service, but also that increases that real and perceived value that the service member has over the control or con career flexibility that they, that they own. Every single day is a new opportunity for the services to win at the decisive point during those daily affirmations of one's decision to continue to serve. Now we understand from where you're sitting, Admiral, this might seem risky. Having the uncertainty where a service member owns their own career and gives that authority back, we get, the service gives that authority back to the individual service member, that is risk, but it's risk that is worth it. Admiral, your best and most effective recruiters and advocates for continued service are right here. It's in all of us. It's in all of us here that, at DARE that care deeply about the success of this organization. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, I'm YNC Tanisha Smith, and I'm going to talk to you about awareness and bringing awareness um, to the process of us bringing in new people um, to join the military in that, that weird space in the beginning before they get to recruitment and how important awareness is and who we should target. Um, awareness is very important to the, the military process and making sure we get that information to our high school students, their parents, the guidance counselors, religious leaders, community uh, members, helps to bridge that gap between before the recruiting process and, and where it starts. And by doing that, we would share authentic um, feedback and, and experiences um, through our own military careers in assisting um, and, and that will help boost recruitment. And so what I mean by that, sir, is by giving them a real life experience. For example, myself, I'm a single mom. Well, I'm married now, but I was a single mom of five. And raising children in the military, how do you incorporate that? And how do you see your life? You know, in the civilian sector, I can have kids and go on maternity leave and traveling around the world with, with um, family just kind of seems difficult. So how do you um, share that with someone um, who doesn't have any perspective of the military? So I think putting um, junior sailors, petty officers, and chiefs in positions where they can share those experiences with sailor brings awareness to the military in turn making people want to continue within the recruiting process. As Tanisha was talking about, the, the goal is to get the awareness out, out to the public prior to even considering the recruitment process. Admiral, the question, part of the question you proposed to us was how do we attract and recruit new talent? Uh, at first, we saw that these two things were very much aligned and almost identical, but then as we peeled the onion back, we looked at the attract piece as that step prior to uh, a recruiter talking to a potential service member. It, during this, this time here, I walked around this, this cut. Sorry, um, okay. I walked around the convention floor and spoke with a woman down there that has uh, two children, one age 19, one age 16, and asked her if one of her children came to her and 
told her that they're interested in joining the military, what her thoughts were on that. And she's from, from Flagstaff, Arizona, not an area where there's sea service concentration. And she said that she would want to know a lot more information about what goes into that, into joining the military. I think we need to start uh, taking a look at that. And the idea that we've come up with is the, the CNO Roadshow to bring awareness to the national public, uh, students, parents, and high school guidance counselors as to what it is to invest in going to the military as a career option to make it equally viable compared to going to college or a trade school. The first part of that is to modernize the harp duty program. Uh, currently, you can take up to 12 days TAD, either in conjunction with leave or from during a PCS, to go back and work for a recruiting station uh, to support their mission and what's going on and get out in the community. I think we take take this and roll it back and treat it as a, a true TAD and pay this, the member that's going per diem, travel benefits, potentially even pay for their travel to go back to their hometown to plug into the community to bring awareness because they can speak the language of where they're from in the country and use, use this Use this as an opportunity to bring awareness and knowledge about what the armed services is to that layer prior to recruiting in case there are questions about it. The other part is to truly do a roadshow concept and take talented, motivated, high performing military members from different units and send them TAD on the road for a six to nine month period to educate parents and students and guidance counselors and other educators about what it means to be in the military. Um, less, less the recruiting standpoint, more of just going out and telling sea stories and answering questions to give that real-time perspective. A good example would be like Tanisha, who's, who's a, a mother with five children, to kind of be able to answer those questions for people that may have family members or dependents that are looking to come into the military. Uh, again, it would be a six, six to nine month plan and then uh, rotate out and they return to their home units. The, the big takeaway of, with awareness is to make families comfortable with sending their, ch their children to the service and that they know that they're going to be taken care of and understanding what that mission is when they com commit those years to military service. Action. Greetings, sir. When a service member first joins our service, they experience their first peak in perceived service value. They're excited, they're happy to be here, and they're looking forward to the journey. It's the battle between perceived service value and that of perceived value of separating from the service. So how do we keep perceived service value high over the life of someone's career? We use the Grass is Greener campaign. The Grass is Greener campaign takes all the things that we share with our members at TAPS, their pension value, their co the cost of health care in the civilian sector, the equivalent civilian salary necessary to match their current status of living, and we share it with them on their administrative systems. This strengthens service value by reducing the idealized luster of separating. It reveals the truth that taxes are high, health care is expensive, and an equivalent salary is difficult to come by. This next measure that we're going to do to help with recruit it with retention is we're going to eliminate reenlistments. We're going to eliminate reenlistments because we're going to eliminate the artificial monolithic conversation of are you staying? Are you going? After the initial enlistment, we're going to treat our people or treat our enlisted folks like we treat officers. We expect continued service. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. We're not going to force them to propose back to the Navy every four to six years like a marriage proposal. Removal of, in, of reenlistments coupled with a few tweaks to billet-based bonuses will give our service flexibility to meet member needs in a new marketplace. We're going to shift our billet structure, our billet assignment structure, to that that's tied to market dynamics. And the way we're going to do that is each year the slate will be published and there's going to be a pot of money that is distributed amongst the most desirable to least desirable billets and it's market based so if someone is interested in going to Pascagoula Mississippi one year there's no need to fund that billet with extra money the next year if that is a highly undesirable billet a lot of money will go there to incentivize an individual to go there 
Further, the shift to uh, these billet-based bonuses is that we should market the whole number, not the monthly stipend that an, that an individual gets while they're there. You market it as a whole number and you provide it to them upfront. This bonus paid upfront is exciting to the member. It creates an opportunity for they could buy a house, they could use it for an investment, they can think about all the great things they can do with this money during their assignment instead of just the cons of going to this place that maybe they weren't so excited about. In closing, these are some of the things that we're going to do on our enlisted side, and we're going to transfer it over to the officer side. Hey. Admiral, we recognize a lot of the proposals that we are talking about here today are going to be an immense drain on the human resources apparatus, or what I'm going to call the human resource apparatus. Now, each of the services call that apparatus something different. Detailers, monitors, career counselors, what have you. But what I'm calling HR are, generally speaking, those individuals that touch a service member at those key operative moments in their career where they're determining whether to stay in, whether to get out, for promotion boards, take orders, what have you. Anybody that touches the service member, both horizontally and vertically, all the way up the chain of command, that is the HR. Now, I would ask you, Admiral, the civilian industry has invested a ton of resources in, in recent years and decades in that HR department, those D HR department entities. Has the Department of the Navy done so? And if not, why not? If people are our priority, we must resource that, again, horizontally and vertically. Our proposal is that you boost and reinforce those individuals responsible to the service member, responsible for having those healthier, more wholesome conversations with service members about their careers and their opportunities and their continued service. The second major proposal that we have, we're calling the opt-out and opt-in proposal. A hundred years ago, the Naval Service underwent a seismic change in how it handled officer promotions specifically, but officer promotions or off promotions generally. Up until that time, officers were promoted merely by the time that they had had in the service. There was a pecking order. You weren't promoted based on your performance, but that all changed. And that changed and we started rewarding the behaviors that we wanted to incentivize with promotions. It's time for another change. At present, officers now have in most of the services, I believe the Coast Guard was the last one this past year, officers can opt out of promotion for whatever reason is inherent or important to that service member at that time in their career. Why do we not have a similar program for our senior enlisted leaders within, within the fleet? They should have an opportunity to opt out of promotion for whatever consideration is important to that service member at that time. Again, we know, Admiral, that you are limited and constrained by Congress and statutes and laws. And I, I'm a lawyer and I'm a judge advocate. I, I, I'm sympathetic to that, to that concern. So you are dictated by promotion zones, uh, promotion demands of Congress, money, monetary concerns, all of those. We believe that this is a fight worth your time and investment. Why can an officer not opt in to promotion that both they believe that they have earned, but their command and chain of command has also believed that they have earned? Similar for senior enlisted. At present, there are those types of, in small quantities, those opportunities such as advance to position, A2P, for a very limited amount of senior enlisted folks. We need to expand this beta test, this, this initial stages of this opt-in sort of uh, general ability to officers. Officers and senior enlisted who opt in for promotion do incur some sort of risk. The risk that might be associated with them opting into promotion prematurely, maybe against their peers, or those of senior rank who have had more time in service, have more fitness reports and more experience. But that is a risk that the service member bears, and that is what we were talking about here today. The control, the career flexibility that a lot of service members do not believe that they meaningfully have, they're not a part of those discussions, that is part of that risk and uncertainty that you bear, but as a service member, there's a tremendous benefit for them being able to dictate the terms of their career. Furthermore, for those service members and those officers specifically that are superior performers that have already satisfied those in-grade professional promotion requirements. They have the endorsement from their chain of command. They have already done maybe billets that are commensurate to or greater than the next rank in, in a session. 
Those are the type of behaviors that we must incentivize across the force. Those are the types of leaders that we want to cultivate. Those are exactly the type of talented leaders that we need to better attract, recruit, and retain as you asked of this group. Each one of those opportunities to promote somebody who has opted in or opted out gives you, Admiral, a face and a success story. At the end of the day, we are not trying to rec retain, recruit, or attract all individuals to service, but we are trying to attract, recruit, and retain the most talented officers, those superior performers. And we believe all of these efforts and initiatives and proposals for you do exactly the question or action the question that you pose to us. Thank you.